From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach. Your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. The spring migration is on, and bird migration is the subject of today's show with guest Ken Kaufman, author of the new book, A Season on the Wind. But first, these messages. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. Underwriting support from High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving organic gardeners and farmers with 100% organic and non-GMO vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. HighMowingSeeds.com slash Away to Garden. Ken Kaufman, originator of the indispensable Kaufman Field Guide series, is one of the world's leading naturalists and experts on birds. His lifelong interest in them began at age six. He and his wife, Kimberly, director of the Black Swamp Bird Observatory, live on the west end of Lake Erie, where spring brings millions of birds virtually to their doorstep. And I'm so glad he's joining us today. Welcome, Ken. How are you? Well, thanks, Margaret. I'm I'm doing well. Good. Well, congratulations on the new book, A Season on the Wind, Inside the World of Spring Migration. Um, You know, it's... One of your earlier books is one of my favorite books, Kingbird Highway. <laughs> um, when you take oh, well, us, you. yeah, when you take us sort of hither and yon, as you detail your own sort of migrations in a given year of your youth, hitchhiking around in pursuit of birds. Um, now, in this new book, you sort of stay put. Do you know what I mean? It's it's about bird migration, but it kind of takes place mostly in this birding mecca in Ohio, near where you live, doesn't it? Uh, Yes, it does. I mean, in the past, I had traveled all over the continent and really all over the world to visit places where there were spectacles of migration, but I didn't really start to gain uh, a deeper understanding of it until I spent some time just staying at home and watching what was happening in one place. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was what turned into the focus for the book. So is there a master plan to the springtime bird movement? I mean, do birds fall into some major categories of behavior having to do with their movements in spring, like how far they move or or don't move and so forth? Are there sort of categories that we can understand as lay people? There there are some, uh, some broad divisions and um, a complete range of, of birds from those that are totally sedentary to those that uh, travel long distances. And, uh, there, there are hardly any birds that just really stay put completely for their whole lives, and even even birds that we think of as residents, like like cardinals, will move around uh, to some extent within a local area. Mm. Um, but then you have you have short distance migrants that um, are are present. Um, you know, they don't have, like, totally separate areas on the range map. Um, <laughs> they may get a little farther north in summer and a little farther south in winter. Um, then the moderately, moderate distance migrants that may go from, say, central Canada to the southern United States for the winter. And then uh, very long distance migrants that may go from, you know, Alaska to Brazil or Argentina. And, yeah. you know, just these astounding long distance migrations. But they're really, they're, there's every stage in between. And the, the ones that go those very long distances, it's not optional. They have to do that, yeah? I mean, it's, I think in the book, maybe you call it hardwired, yeah? Those are, they're hardwired to have to do that. Whereas some of the ones that are, can move a little, they don't have to move quite as far. They can move a couple hundred miles or something. Yes, that's exactly right. The, um, the, uh, the long distance ones, the hardwired ones, are sometimes called obligate migrants, and then the others that can be more flexible will be called facultative migrants. And uh, most of the the latter are the short distance right. travelers. And you know, an example would be something like the killdeer, which uh, you know they they live out in the open fields here, and uh, in where I am in northern Ohio, the last killdeers of the fall disappear sometime in. Oh, early to mid-December, and then the first ones come back in mid-February. So it's 
<laughs> it hardly seems worth the trouble. Right. And they, they may only go as far as, as the southern part of the state before they turn around and come back. Right. But they can... Uh, they can vary their their timing and their distance, and they uh, they may travel. You know, they may come north earlier in a warmer spring, and so they, they've got the flexibility that most birds don't. Right. So, what are the triggers that say to birds, "Time to move"? Is it just follow the food? Is it that simple? Or um, I think there's uh, one of the chapters in the book. The new book is called creatures of light um and it and it, i think it talks about some triggers having to do with our response as animals ours and theirs <laughs> to, to to light and so forth so what are the triggers that say it's time the ones that we that we know something about a lot of them have to do with the uh, the length of the daylight and uh-huh. the, the birds are really attuned to so the the timing of sunrise sunset and as they change with the seasons uh, uh, the birds will start to move um, it would make sense to think they're just following the availability of food but actually if in fall um, a lot of birds will fly south and fly away from habitats that are that are full of food they, they leave before the cold weather arrives and it's just um, you know, the the timing is, uh, is is set by the change in light levels um, there, you know, there'll be some places near the equator where that wouldn't work, and where, uh, you know, they may be driven more by uh, changes from wet season to dry season. But uh, in North America, the length of the daylight really seems to be the driving factor. Interesting. Um, I mean, I noticed that living in a rural place. I noticed that about so many animals seem to know, uh, you know, and I shouldn't anthropomorphize, but I will anyway. <laughs> I'll use words like seem to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but seem to, uh, it, things change, uh, the sounds in the morning. I was just talking about this with some birding friends yesterday. You know, there's that moment in later summer where the dawn chorus, the whole sound changes, and you see other kinds of animals doing activities, like you see more hoarding behavior among some animals that are going to, you know, hibernate or sort of semi-hibernate. You know, like the activities and the patterns change at a moment, and it can't be that everybody looked at their calendar. Do you know what I mean? And said, oh, it's the day we're supposed to do this. Like, it must be the trigger of light, yeah, of day length. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it has to be, and I I, I really do think that that humans uh, can become attuned to the, the regime of light in the area where they live. Well, and you talked about that in the book, about you were kind of disoriented. You moved to Ohio, I don't remember how many years ago, um, from a different region, yes? Yeah, in uh, in 2005, I moved from Arizona to Ohio, and I noticed almost immediately that it was different there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah <but laughs> including, the, including the light levels, and so I was sort of disoriented for a couple of years until I gradually uh, became attuned to it. Yeah. Um, so speaking of light, um, is does migration mostly take place in darkness at night, or are there some birds who move during the daylight hours? That's one of the, the fascinating things about it, and one of the things that makes it um, hard to study is that uh, there are uh, quite a few species of larger birds that, that do migrate in daylight. Um, most of the hawks, for example, are... Oh. Are daytime flyers, uh, cranes uh, mostly migrate by day. Um, ducks and geese may migrate by by day or by by night, uh, but most of the smaller birds, uh, most of the songbirds, which are of course the most abundant ones, uh, migrate at night, mm. and so they'll they'll take off just after it gets dark and fly through the night, and then if they're over land, they'll come down around dawn and. Um, you know, of course, this this makes it hard to study what's going on up there. Mm. And and do we have a, a con, an, an idea of why we think that's the case? Are they navigating celestial navigation, or is it because it's cooler at night? Is there a reason that we think? There have been a lot of um, a lot of ideas uh, tossed around um, for uh, for why they're migrating at night. Um, you know the. Um, the air masses may be a little more stable than mm. maybe fewer predators flying around. Um, right. You know, the hawks are migrating in the daytime, so 
<laughs> so, so if you're a songbird, really <laughs> yeah, yeah, makes a difference. <laughs> I um, see. Yeah, and yeah. they they do use uh, navigation by the by the stars, although daytime migrants can navigate by the sun as well. Yeah, I, I remember years ago hearing about flyways. These sort of, I mean, as I visualized it from being told or re- reading about it years ago, the sort of highways or corridors in the sky that I imagined that you know birds travel during migration. You know, and but that's not the way it's understood now, is it? That, you're right. It's um, the idea of flyways was was first developed in the 1930s when people first started getting uh, lots of returns of banding studies of ducks and uh, ducks to some extent do follow sort of uh, defined uh, pathways because they have to move between specific water areas and uh, so so you'll have. You know, even though they they cross and they go in all different directions, you will have some sort of major routes of travel uh, for the ducks. And so, um, a guy named Frederick Lincoln named these flyways back in the 1930s as you know, Atlantic, uh, Mississippi, Central, and Pacific flyways. But mm-hmm. as it turns out, most birds don't follow those. <laughs> and they they don't concentrate. Um, <laughs> the birds haven't read the book. Exactly. You know, they, um, <laughs> so they. Uh, they don't. They don't concentrate in specific pathways. Um, they spread out as much as they can, and they only they only concentrate where they're sort of forced to by by geography. So, if you could, especially if these these nocturnal migrants, if you could look down at North America, um, like in early May, a night of peak migration, you wouldn't see rivers of birds flowing toward the north. Instead, it would look like a like a blanket of birds being pulled northward, stretching all the way across the continent, and with no no real gaps except, you know, perhaps going around major mountain ranges, uh, going around storms. That mm. sort of thing. Mm. Uh, so, s- sort of strategic differences, um, things to avoid, et cetera. And and you talk in the book, um, you know, about some like the raptors, which you were mentioning before. Um, they they use the thermals. They use the these. I don't even understand exactly what it is. But how do thermals work, and what birds take advantage of them? That's another word you know that I, I think people like myself have heard. Um, like we've heard about flyways, we've heard about thermals. What's what's thermals? A thermal is just a sort of a bubble or column of rising air, um, air that's been heated by you know, sunlight hitting the land or something. So the so warm air rises in a particular spot, and birds of prey in particular will take advantage of those. They'll find this rising air and just spiral up into the sky, and then they get to the sort of the upper part of the thermal where it's it's becoming weaker, and they'll peel off and go gliding uh, in the direction they want to go until they come to another thermal and then rise again. So they can can go for miles without flapping their wings. And so that's um, that's efficient, yeah. I mean, that's if you're if you're going to go a period of time without eating, maybe you need to conserve energy. And is that sort of a strategic thing then? Yeah, exactly. And and for the birds of prey, it can be it can be a challenge to you know they're the smaller birds may be eating all day, but for a, for a hawk, it's 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 a challenge to to find prey when you're traveling. And so they. Um, uh, to the extent that they can save energy, they do. Hmm. We learn, um, you know, we humans learn more about migration lately, partly thanks to sort of advances in technology, you know, tracking devices and radar or whatever. But um, like you give an example in the book of this, quote, champion thrush that was tagged with a device and then observed to fly nonstop I think across the Caribbean and all the way to Canada, you know, again, nonstop, pretty amazing. And you write, in sharing that anecdote, you then write, uh, I love science and I hate it. And then you say, in a way, we know more about the birds' travels than they do. Tell me a little bit about that part of the story for you. Oh, well, I was, I was admitting, I was opening up there and admitting Sort of the, the ambivalence I have about this. I um, I've spent you know I've spent so much time um, reading 
<laughs> scientific and technical yes, works. Yes, yes. Dozens of technical volumes and hundreds of scientific papers to try to understand the, the science of it. But I don't ever want to lose sight of the fact that we're we're witnessing something here that's just that's magical. It's, it's, it's a miracle. Um, and just it should be just a total source of wonder. And I, I find that I, the more facts that I learn about, uh, about the migration of birds, um, actually the more wonderful it becomes. The knowing, knowing more about how they do it um, doesn't make me any less impressed with the fact that it happens at all. Mm. Um, I really feel like it's, a, it's this massive worldwide miracle that happens twice a year, and uh, um, I just, I hope I'll never get over the uh, the sense of wonder at it. Yeah. And it just seems sad when sometimes people will take something and make a very scientific analysis of it and, and try to be, you know, dry and formal and technical because they feel like they have to do that to be scientific. And, right. Um, I think... You know, the, the best scientists I've met have never lost their their sense of wonder, like almost a childlike uh, yes, amazement awe. and wonder mm. at what we see out there. Yeah. Um, so speaking of uh, facts, um, one in the book that comes back, sort of this riff that goes through the book, and it's not such a happy fact, but it's um, the fact that we uh, humans in trying – um, the theoretical goal being to uh, develop um, types of energy that are more green, um, that we may be causing havoc um, and harming birds um, by some of our tactics. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how that knowledge kind of came to you and um, with the wind turbines and so forth. Okay. Yes, we... Um Everyone I know who really pays close attention to birds is is realized that the uh, the climate is changing. The climate is yes. uh, overall becoming warmer, and uh, weather is becoming more extreme. And you know, we recognize that climate change is a real thing that has to be addressed. So I don't know anyone who's opposed to uh, green energy or renewable energy, but uh, there are some places where we have to be careful about what we put up. And, you know, wind energy can be really effective in some places, but a, a tall tower with spinning blades, um, understandably, can be bad for things that fly around in the sky. And <laughs> so, yeah. um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a paradox that um, we're not opposed to wind energy, but we think that location location is extremely important. Yes. And um, uh, certain types of places are such concentration points for birds that wind power really doesn't belong there. One example would be stopover habitat for these migratory birds. I mean, the, the area where I live in northwestern, northwestern Ohio, birds that are migrating across the continent come down before they come to the edge of Lake Erie, and so we get massive concentrations of birds stopping over there, feeding, resting, getting ready for their next flight. So these nocturnal migrants are arriving in the dim light just before dawn. They're coming down and landing in this, you know, half-light before dawn. They're taking off just after it gets dark at night. So at the times of day when the visibility is worse, they would be flying through the uh, through the part of the air column that would be swept by the rotors of wind turbines. Yeah. So, so we do, we feel that um, the wind power should be kept out of these critical stopover habitats for birds. It seems so obvious, and yet the struggle um, that you depict in the book, and and probably others that have been happening in other areas that you talk about in your area that that you and your wife and others have have, um, you know, sought to change um, to get it out, get that kind of a project out of that type of a habitat. Um, are, it, it's, it's pretty shocking. Again, it seems obvious that we should avoid this, and yet we're not avoiding this. Um, so that was a... It, it should yeah. be. <laughs> <laughs> it should be obvious, shouldn't it? I mean, yeah. you know, if we... Wind, wind turbines, 
we, we shouldn't put them up like at the end of the runway at a major airport. Yeah. You know, that, that's not a good place for them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, in the last few minutes uh, together, I wanted to, you know, it's it's the time, it's it's migration, um, it's spring, and, you know, you've been watching migrations for a long time, and you're an expert at this, an expert observer. I, I noted that, um, I think it was the Audubon website where you're a contributor, they did an excerpt from the book, and I think the headline was something like, Backyard is one of the best spots to witness bird migration, um, is our backyard the place we should we should become a more astute um, observer of migration? Or tell us like a little bit of you know invite us um, to the places we should go or what kinds of places we should go. Um, I really feel like the backyard is is the <laughs> the best place to look. I know not everyone even has a yard, but yeah, um, any 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 local park. Uh, any little area of uh, of garden or you know, public gardens or semi natural habitat uh, is a place to observe bird migration because it is happening on a broad front. Um, you don't have well. I was going to say you don't have to live on a flyaway, but we all live on a flyaway, right? You know, we're, we're all there. So so just um, just getting out um, every day and just looking around to see what happens. Um, Migrating birds will come through, and in in the book I talk about you know they I mean yeah I live in a place that's great for migration but a lot of the book focuses on things like like robins and um, red winged blackbirds and and common birds and song sparrows how they respond to um, how they respond to the arrival of spring and uh, staying in one place and watch watching the season unfold I think is is the best way to learn about it. Yeah. Um, I find it kind of inspiration um, and validation maybe also in participating in, and I don't do it, you know, in a major way, but I do it a couple of times each week in a citizen science kind of a thing like eBird.org, you know, of recording my sightings, you know, the first day that the male rose-breasted grosbeak showed up for this spring in my yard last week, and, you know, who's around each day. Today was a wood pee eastern wood peewee, and so on and so forth. I, and I love going there and seeing, exploring in the explore area, seeing in my county that someone else saw a similar bird a day or two before or whatever. You know, it's that sort of sense that it's happening in a bigger way, even though I'm only in my backyard looking out the window. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, that, that that's a wonderful way to take part in. I, I'm I'm addicted to eBird and other <laughs> settings there, and I I just love the way it it reveals things. Like um, having, you know, there were um, there were three uh, red-breasted nuthatches out in the yard the other day, um. and it could have been just you know um, just a fluke. But I I went to eBird and started looking around, and there were um, red-breasted nuthatches passing through. Um, all over the area yes. um, at the same time. So it, it puts our own sightings in context. Yes. A wonderful thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love the book, A Season on the Wind, Inside the World of Spring Migration. Ken, um, uh, are you writing something else now, or are you, are you taking a little bit of a break? <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, I, I think I'm going to be continuing to work on books uh, probably for the rest of my life. Yeah, uh, I can't help it either. <laughs> I'm also very, I'm very much enjoying the the brand new edition of your book. Oh, uh, good. Way to guard it, just wonderful. Oh, wonderful. good. I, oh, good. I, I love your prose style and. Oh. Um, well, that's very sweet. So, that's a high compliment because I've been, as I said, reading your books um, for a long time, and um, both the literary ones, the ones like this, and also the the field guides. So um, that you kind of founded that that group of field guides. I have many of them in my um, on my shelf next to where I work all day, and always looking things up. So thank you so much for this and for those. I'll, I'll send you a note once I get close enough to having another one ready Good. to come out. 
Good, good. Well, thank you for taking the time today. I'll talk to you soon again, I hope. Underwriting support from High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving organic gardeners and farmers with 100% organic and non-GMO vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. HighMowingSeeds.com slash Away to Garden. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. Thanks to all of you for listening, and don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version on Stitcher or iTunes. Find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Instagram or Facebook as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening and bird watching meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. Mm-hmm.